I will do my best to get done by noon. I really will. I, I, I don't want to be in a hurry, like hurry the Lord. I don't want to stop, but I will do my best. I'm respectful of time. However, I really do. I have, I thought this would go two weeks anyway because I got a lot. I, you know, I got up Monday morning and, and um, I got up Monday morning and I was going to go like one direction. You know what I mean? Like I, I want to study things and get in the word. And man, the Holy Spirit just, just like compelled me and led me into Romans chapter 12. You can turn there. And it was like all week long, I just, every morning when I got up, it was like the Spirit was just teaching me. Anybody ever have that happen? I'm sure we're all members of the body. Just pouring into me and... Um, and just putting layer, and poor Pam, she hears my message seven times before you guys hear it once. And I always tell her, like the Lord will give me a good thought, and I always say, man, I hope I can remember that for Sunday, because I'll, I'll get a good thought. But I tell you, I've prayed over this message, and I've studied into it, and I believe the Lord gave me a word for our church. Now, that wouldn't be surprising, would it, since I'm the pastor? And I believe it's for us. I wish some folks were here that, that weren't. I wanted everybody to be here today because it's a word for our church. And maybe I feel like this often, but man, if we can get this, if, if we can get this, what the Lord wants to do in this church, and he wants to do something in our church, I have been praying so much for this church. I shouldn't be surprising either, should it? I should be praying. And when I pray, I'll pray for various ones of you. I'll think of you. I'll call you out by name. And I pray for the church in general, but I prayed for many of you specifically. I think Pam and I named everybody in the church last night when we were praying. And you know, you know what's funny? I don't want to tell you how we coupled you guys up. But, you know, I'll say, be with Jackie and Mike, Jeff and Evelyn, Chuck and Dana, and I'll, I'll be naming people. Then I'll get to a single person, Charlie. So I have to pair you up with somebody, Charlie. <laughs> so, I mean, it can't just be Charlie. It has to be Charlie and somebody else. So we, we, you know, we got you guys all paired up, whether you know it or not. We just pray for you in pairs. <laughs> Amen. But I think we prayed for everybody in the church, everybody we could think of last night. And the Lord just put, it's, it's a gift from God. The Lord just put it in my heart. And he has showed me, I'm going to get into this, <clears throat> talking to me about the body this week and about, God's desire, I want to get to this before I get to, you know, the, the heart of this. God's desire, we, we think a lot like about a man of God. Someone name me a man of God. Like someone you think, that's a man of God. Just throw, give me a name. Larry Humphrey. Larry Humphrey, good. Give me another one. Charlie, Charlie. good. <laughs> Don't be humble, Charlie. Give me somebody else. Charlie. Who? Scott. Scott Hayes, give me somebody else. Jeff Houck, me, okay, yeah. Ken, now I see, I, now me, when I, you guys, are, that's cool, what, the way you guys are going, that's wonderful, Bo, man of God, when I think, when I was thinking of man of God, I was thinking like John G. Lake, you know what I mean, I'm thinking, oh, you guys are men of God, surely you are men of God, you guys got to be like that, when you think of someone, like, who do you think of, when you think, like, in that way, anybody, Kenneth, Kenneth Hagin, Smith Wigglesworth, love Smith. Billy Graham, just down there at his facility. Huh? Bill Johnson. Anybody else? Charles Capps. White. Todd White. Todd White. Yeah, powerful. Tim Tebow. Dude, way to go. That's a good one, man. Yeah, that's a good one. Tim Tebow. Man, nice. Tim Tebow, man of God. He is a man of God. He's, he's a bold, he's loving. He's a good balance of loving and bold, isn't he, Tim Tebow? So when we think, of, and of course, Jeff's a man of God. Charlie's a man of God. But we think of men of God, you know, you always think about, about what God, man, look what God did with Smith Wigglesworth. Or look what he did with Todd White. Or look what he did with John G. Lake. What the Lord is showing me so much <clears throat> is what he wants in the church when we get together. It's not about being like, like the, capital T, man of God, your pastor or someone that you might think, or the, the big, big Larry, the man of God. 
But God is teaching me and showing me that he is very interested in every person in this body growing. Growing. And, and, and there's a way in God to grow. He doesn't want you to stagnate. I was so glad because almost as if the Lord spoke to me, we had the body participate in a prophetic reading of the scripture by Jeff and by Charlie. You know, because God will do that. God wants each person in the church to grow, and he wants each person in the Lord to find their place and even their service, how they're supposed to be serving God. I believe with all my heart that every Christian in this room loves God and wants to serve in some capacity. It is against your nature not to want to. You have to fight against yourself and God not to serve. Someone say amen. It's true. You got the servant inside of you. And so he wants to serve. And so the Lord was really talking to me about his heart for the church. It's not his heart for John Lake or... Do you know why God raises up John Lakes or Heidi Bakers or any You know why he raises up people like that? Hmm? Yeah, to, the, the word says in Ephesians 4 to build up the body. He does, and, and because they're willing, certainly that's why they get chosen. They're willing, but, but he uh, raises them up. He says the prophet, the pastor, the apostle, the, the evangelist, all those ministry gifts are to build up the body. It's not so we can sit there and say, oh my goodness, what a Christian that guy is. Boy, and Charlie, you said the other day, God speaks to all of us in one way or the other. Just get in the word, he'll speak to you. But the reason there's pastors or God gifts people in such powerful ways, I remember Evelyn, that word you had, I'll never forget it. She called that guy out, had the dog. It was so specific, it was wild. In that it wasn't so everybody would say, oh wow, what a... Evelyn, wow, that, that was, could you manufacture that? Could you just make that up? No way. God did that because he wanted to bless that dude that was struggling from his past. So he'll give you a word to give to somebody. He'll give you a gift of healing. But all these ministry gifts are for the body because God's very interested in you. And of course he's interested in the pastors too. And he's interested in the preachers. And if you're willing, he'll do great things in your life. But Danny, he wants to do great things in your life. So I want to read this. I want to read um, Romans 12. I'm going to really probably read the whole chapter. And to be honest, I could read much scripture today. I have so many scriptures like the Lord just layering this upon layer. But I want to set the backdrop because a lot of times when we read the scriptures, Jesus did it, Paul did it. But we'll take scriptures kind of out of context. Don't we do that? Like, we'll just, like, um, that scripture, uh, I have plans for you and plans for good and to do you no harm, Jeremiah 29. You know, that scripture in context was Israel was going into captivity and God told them, go into captivity. You're going to go into captivity, but I have plans for you to do you good. In, that, in the context of that scripture, he says, you're going to go into captivity, but I'm only going to do you good. So just go and I'll be with you. Read it in context. It's amazing. But a lot of times, and it's okay sometimes because God will give us a prophetic word. Jesus did it all the time. Take a prophetic word and we'll pray with that word. We'll use that word. But the Bible was written in context, wasn't it? So theologically, we want to understand things in context Although sometimes prophetically, God will speak a word to us directly. I remember one time, scripture in Mark chapter 5, God said, go home and tell your family what great things I've done for you. And he literally spoke it to me to go home. Now, that's not a theology. That's the Lord just spoke. And I did. And someone gave me money. It was miraculous. The whole story was miraculous how he did it. Someone actually gave me the money to go home. I didn't ask him to. They just did. It was powerful. It was prophetic. But in the context of Romans chapter 12, Paul has been laying this case for God's mercy and God's grace. I want you to get this, and I'm going to go back and show you a few of the verses. But when Paul starts off, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, he's talking to Christians, in view of God's mercy. He's saying that in the context of everything he's already said in his letter. In fact, if you just go right up 
above that, in verse 32, he says, God has bound all men over to disobedience or unbelief so that he may have what? Mercy on everyone. So do you see the context of that verse? He's saying in view of God's mercy. It's back in chapter 9, verse 16. Paul just is going on. He's writing. I think Paul is just writing by inspiration. I just... He's just flowing, you can tell. He's one scripture, and he kind of writes how I preach sometimes. He's just writing and throwing scriptures in there, and writing, and he's making a, it's just coming to him, and he's putting all this, and he's trying to make a point. But way back in chapter 9, verse 16, he says, It does not depend, therefore, on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. That's the context that's the context of what we're going to teach here. He's saying, I urge you, I beseech you, hey, I'm begging you in view of God's mercy and grace in your life. I'm going to tell you what we should be doing as our reasonable service, as our spiritual act of worship. I'm urging you to do this. I heard a guy preaching, and I love this guy. I'm not critical. I don't understand how these guys can go around preaching, criticizing preachers all the time. Ooh, that's scary. That just scares me. Just the way they just lightly, just, and I, it's okay to correct doctrine and make sure we're preaching good doctrine. But man, just to be criticizing preachers all the time, that's, that's a dangerous place to live. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want anything to do with it. It grosses me out. But I heard a guy preach this week that I respect, but he was talking about, he said, you want to get saved. You need to pick up your cross. He said, you need to do this. And he's all this, you know, you need to, God is a fearful God. And he was contexting out of the reading out of the Old Testament and like, wow. And, you know, I'm examining my heart. Am I saved? You know, you got to do this and you got to do that. And I'm like, wow, like thinking about it. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me right in the middle of it. And he says, Brad, is that how you got saved? I said, oh, no, not at all. I was rebellious. I was sinful. I was a fornicator and a liar. I smoked Marlboro, pack and a half a day, and I loved them. Didn't have any desire to give them up. I was a beer drinker. I was a liar. Said that twice, just to make sure you knew that. <laughs> I, if I could, I was a flirter. I was married, and I wasn't, I was just, my heart was everywhere but where it should have been. And Friday night, I was in a bar flirting with a girl, and nothing happened, but I was flirting with her, went home, I was married, got a kid. I was a sinner. I was the opposite of what that man described. Totally opposite of what that man described. I wasn't surrendered. I hadn't taken up my cross. I hadn't done anything. I was nasty. I deserved to go to a devil's hell. And I, some dude asked me to church on Sunday. And I stood in that church. And that man gave a call to Jesus. And I've told this story many times. I won't belabor it. But he said, you're a sinner. And there's no doubt about it, and you need Jesus. And my heart started pounding in my chest. And the Holy Ghost, I didn't know it was the Holy Ghost, but someone was inside of me saying, you are a sinner, and you do need Jesus. And I was an agnostic at the time. I had been a believer at one time. And by the mercy of God, by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, I somehow, after three times someone asking me to go forward, I drug my carcass down to that altar and I prayed a simple prayer that took me in a back room. This dude laid hands on me to be filled with the Holy Spirit and lo and behold, Danny, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And I mean, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I came out of there, don't tell anybody, Lois, I was talking in tongues. I don't want to be kicked out of the church. I was praying in tongues and those Marlboros, they were gone. That Stroh's, I like Stroh's. I don't know if that's crazy. It was cheap. It was good. <laughs> I just dumped it right down. The st and I had things under my bed that shouldn't have been. I threw them away. What I'm saying is I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. God did it. It was his mercy on my life. I didn't deserve it. I was a sinner. That's why I'm, I'm not hard on sinners when I talk to them. 
you know, you guys sometimes maybe you think I'm hard because I'm trying to urge you to dedicate to Jesus more, but I am not hard. I, you get, put me around a, a homosexual lesbian and I want to reach him. My heart starts stirring inside of me. I want to say something to him about Jesus because I know who I was. Jesus said, if you're forgiven much, you love much. And I've been forgiven a bunch. A whole bunch. And it was God's mercy. I didn't pick up my cross. I didn't do all those things. I didn't. I responded to an altar call where somebody said, you need Jesus. And it wasn't even me that went down to the altar. I had the hand of God on the back of my neck, scruffing me down to the altar. Literally. Kicking and screaming all the way. I don't want to be saved. I don't want to be good. I want to drink. I want to carry on. No, I ain't going to say that, Lord. <laughs> I almost said I want to vote Democrat, but I didn't say it. <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> Father, forgive me. <laughs> I'm trying to drive this point home, guys. Because the Lord told me, because that's not how you got saved, Brad. And he said, that's, that's a good preacher. He's a great brother, but that ain't how people get saved. And I said, yeah, you're right, Lord. I can't argue with that. Those scriptures are valid, and I'm going to flip them a little bit and show you how the Lord talked to me about it. In the context of Romans 12, in the view of God's mercy, Paul quoted Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Hosea. I read the whole book of Hosea this week. And the reason, right away, Monday, Tuesday, because God was giving me the context. God in Hosea told his prophet, go marry a harlot, go marry a prostitute, so you know what I'm going through with my people, basically. Prophets got it tough sometimes. Gomer, and he did. He married Gomer. She was a prostitute. He married a prostitute, and God was saying, look what I go through with my people. He said, now, I know she cheated on you. I know she left you. I know she's sleeping with every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the community, but go take her back. Forgive her. Provide for her. And I want you to love her, and I want you to have children with her. Whoa. But Lord, I have grounds for divorce. Love her anyway. So Hosea did, because God was making Hosea an object lesson. And then God keeps saying, and I don't think people understand, God told me this week about Hosea, we heard two years of teaching on it one time, God told me this week about Hosea, he says, Brad, Hosea is a love letter. He said, it's a love letter. My heart is broken for my people. Because in one chapter, he says, I'm going to judge you, I'm going to squash you out, I'm going to pour out my wrath on you, you're a cheater, Israel, and I'm going to blast you and then in chapter 8 he comes around and says how can I judge you how can I cast you away how can I send you away my heart is bursting inside of me I don't want to judge you I want you to come back you cheater you unfaithful bride I still want you I can't help myself read it one chapter he wants to slam him and the next one he's saying I just can't do it and then he goes on saying I'm going to do it but he says, one day, one day, I'm going to have all my people. And then he even prophesies, and this is what Paul quotes, he even prophesies about the Gentile nations coming in. Someone's going to serve him. Someone's going to obey him. And he knew that Judah, Israel needed, and he loved Israel. He Talk about wrath, and God was always under the old covenant, under the law. When you break that law, wrath comes. Paul said the law works wrath. You want wrath? Get under the law, because the law works wrath. God's a holy, perfect God, and if we're trying to approach God by a covenant of law, we are in big trouble because it is going to work wrath in your life. God's holiness never changes. We can't go to God. You know, I've been fasting. I, I, I've been praying. I've been reading my Bible. I've been witnessing. I've been giving. And I don't dare go to God and say, God, look what I've been doing. He'll say, oh, yeah? Look what you haven't been doing. Your conscience will just smite you for everything you're not doing. You'll never get peace with God going to God and asking God to look at what you're doing. You'll never get your prayers. I understand we can't willfully sin. I never advocate it. I'm going to get there and how God works this thing. 
We're not supposed to willfully sin, but you're not going to get your prayers answered because your righteousness measures up one day, that you're good enough. Jeff, you didn't deserve to prophesy today, but God used you anyway. He knows you're down-sitting and you're uprising. He loved his unfaithful people. And Pam, he didn't want to put them away. And he was wrenched. And there's a lot there. And judgment came, folks. But it was 722 AD that Israel got judged. And that was after year upon year upon year upon year of warning them and prophesying to them. He could have judged them. He told Moses, Moses, just get out of the way. I'm going to judge them now. He could have done it way back then. Moses, get out of the way. I'm going to squash them right now. Moses said, no, God, don't do that. You're an intercessor. You've got to intercede for people. You're the one that says, oh, no, God, don't do that. Well, the truth is God didn't want to, and he used Moses' prayers as an intercessor. He said, okay. But he said, hey, I can't even go. Get, think about the Old Testament for a minute. He said, I can't even go with this people, because if I get too close to them, I'm going to kill them. Did you know that was in the Bible? I can't, I, God's holy. He said, I, I, I can't even walk with them anymore, because if I, if I keep walking with them, he says, I can't get, if I get too close to them, my anger is going to burn. Read it. But that wasn't God's heart for him. His heart was mercy and grace. And we see that so clear at the cross. And so Paul was talking about this. He's, he says that God's bound them all in unbelief, the Jews and the Gentiles. And why did he bind everybody over to unbelief? So he could have mercy on everyone. That's his heart. God wants to have mercy and grace on everyone. That's what he said. So Paul now, we're going to flip this. Now Paul is saying, in light of God's mercy... Viewing God's mercy. That's why I just don't understand unforgiveness. <clears throat> I don't understand unforgiveness. Maybe you're better than me, but I know what I've done, and I know I don't have any right to hold anybody's sin against them. I know that. So if I do, I start holding people's sins against them. I've got to get that off of me because I don't have any right not to forgive people because I know how much God forgave me. Who am I? To condemn ultimately anybody else. And he says, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Get this now. This will please you, Charlie. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Or King James says, this is your reasonable service. So what he's saying is, guys, look at what God did. God saved you. God pulled you out of the gutter. You, you might not have been a big sinner like your pastor, but God still, you needed to be saved. You were unworthy of being saved. You didn't deserve to be saved. And God did. Your works, plus, your works didn't do the job. It wasn't God needed something from you. Everything he needed, he did it himself. He said, I want to save Israel. I am going to send my own arm to save them. They can't save themselves. I'm going to become a man. I'm going to send my own arm and I'm going to save them. You can't save yourself. I'm going to save you. The Bible says salvation is of the Lord. So in view of that, <clears throat> is it so much to ask you to, prevent, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice? God's put his spirit in you. He's given you eternal life. He's changed your nature. You're dead to sin. You're a new creation. You've been forgiven. You get a brand new start. Isn't it just your reasonable service to give him everything? And that's where we pick up our cross. We don't work for salvation. Get this in your theology. You do not work for your salvation. You work from your salvation. 
you do pick up your cross, it's in the view of God's mercy. And I want to tell you right now, it has ever, I'm going to show you, I don't even have time to get into that this week. I want to show you how much you love God. I don't mean pretending like you love God or acting like you love God. How much you really love God depends on what cross you're willing to pick up. You men understand this. When you first met your wife, when you met your girlfriend, she would give you a call and say, can you come over? You would be out that door. It could be raining. It could be storming. I, I, Dina, how are things now? You could be raining, winter, spring, summer, or fall. All you got to do is call, and I'll be there. Yes, I will. You got a friend. And I'd like to be more than a friend, if i be honest. Right? Because you love her. Because you love her. You want to please her. See someone else with her and make your heart jealous. You want to be with her. You buy her stuff because you love her. And when we get this and we allow the love of God, John said, it's not that you love God. It's that God loved you. We love him because he first, doesn't it say that? We love him because he first loved us. And when we get a vision of God's love for us, how much he loves us, we want to love him back. It's called bridal love. It's called first love. Lovers, you can't fake it. People that are crazy in love with God, if you're not in love with God, if you don't have a passion with God, it's because you let your love smolder. You've let other things enter in, and you're still a Christian, perhaps, but you've let things smolder in your heart. You just don't love God like you used to do. You've lost that love and feeling. And it's gone, gone, gone. Whoa, oh, 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 Jeff and Charlie, come stand next to me. Whoa. Oh, oh, oh. Ain't that right? I've been praying. I said, God, there's songs, vineyard songs. Be my first love. I've been saying, God, give me that bridal love. I was reading a book by Basilia Schlenk. And... Um, it's called my all for him. And she said it's all about loving God. That's what Heidi Baker says too. She says it's all about loving God. When we know who God is, when we really set our love upon him, it says because you have set your love upon me, therefore with long life I will bless you. Therefore, because you have set, we're not under law, we're under grace. We're in the love, we're in the love boat. We're in the love machine. We're in love with God in view of his mercy. We should be. And it is that love of God, and i got scriptures on it, it's that love of God that will cause you to lay down your life. i, I got to read this scripture because i got so much there. The greatest commandments, oh gosh, I could just preach, I haven't even dented my message. I haven't even dented it. The greatest, they asked Jesus what the great commandments were. He said, love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, and there's no commandments like it. And Jesus looked at that guy and said, okay, do it and live. Do you know that's language of the law? Did you ever think about that? I think it's Luke 19. That's law language. Do it and live. Oh, okay. You're right with God. You're good. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, do it and live. I'd say the same thing to any lost person. Oh, you're lost? Uh, love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor. And, yeah, okay, do it. Just try to do it. Try to love God. Preacher talks about tithing. You'll be throwing stones at him. Come on now. Takes a love offering. You have a stone in your hand. You ain't getting my money. Honey. We don't even love God and love our neighbor to be saved. That's the language of law. If you look in Romans 10, 5, I double dog dare you, Paul said, law talks like this, do it and live. That's what the law talks like, do this and live. So Jesus is saying, go ahead, love your neighbor, love God. You don't love your neighbor and you don't love God unless, unless, unless God has saved you, unless God has poured his mercy out on you unless God has given you grace, unless God has changed your spots and cleaned them up, unless God has put his spirit in you and you're following after the Lord. 
That's true. You don't get saved by loving your neighbor. Don't ever think that. You love your neighbor because you're saved. You don't love God. God loves you. You don't love God. You'll turn your back on God. If his Holy Spirit wasn't in you, that song up there said it, Gideon. I hear my voice among the scoffers. Is that just a song or is that the truth? I hear my voice among the scoffers. That's me up there with the saying crucify him. That's me scoffing Jesus. That's me making fun of the preacher. That's me up there not loving my neighbor. Okay, let's go on. I, got it. I, I, I can't even... I can't even get into it. I'll, I'll, I hope I can pick up on it next. There is so much power in this. I want to show you this. <clears throat> and then I'll end. What time does anybody know? No way. Yeah. <laughs> is it really 10 after? You're kidding. Okay, I, I got to get this. Maybe we'll figure out where we're going next week. So he says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now get this, my renewal is so much more, the Lord show me, than just reading and meditating in the word, it, that is a part of it, you have to be in the word. My renewal is taking on the mind of Christ. My renewal is having the mind of Christ. That's what my renewal is, and we need the scriptures to do that. We need the mind of Christ. Because Paul immediately says, For by the grace given unto me, I say unto every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God has what? Given you. It was a gift. The measure of faith you got. Be sober. God gave you that. You got to do something with your faith, but God gave you that measure of faith. You didn't even do it yourself. He gave, I know he gave it to me because he drug me down to the altar. Am I getting too loud? I, I, I don't want to pause this too much. <clears throat> Just as each one of you <clears throat> has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function... In Christ, we who are many form one body, and we're each members that belong to another. We have different gifts according to the grace given unto us. According to what? Grace. You don't got grace, you can't do it. That's why you shouldn't try to pastor if you're not, not the pastor. You don't have the grace to do it. You don't want me leading singing, I promise you. There'd be a lot of grace, but it would be on you, not on the gift. Amen? You can't be Charlie, there's only one Charlie. There's only one you. I can't be you. If you prophesy, then prophesy according to your faith. If you serve, serve. Teach, teach. Encourage, encourage. You give gifts, do it. Give gener generously. If you lead, lead with diligence. And show mercy, show mercy. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Get this. This is where I'm going. Next two verses. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourself. Every time Paul talks about the gifts, every single time, he talks about the body. And he talks about humility. You love God. You love God. It says, you cannot love God who you do not see and then not love your brother. It is impossible. Get this. It's impossible. Love God, love your neighbor. If you don't love your brother, you do not love God. You can read those scriptures. And I, I'm not trying to be super... Con only the Holy Spirit can convict you. I'm not trying to be Joe Heavy. To the measure that you serve and love your brother, that's how much you love God. If you're indifferent to your brother... You don't want to be around your brothers and sisters in the Lord. You don't want to serve them with your gifts. It's your coldness toward God that causes that. Vertical, you cause trouble, your vertical's wrong. You're causing trouble in the horizontal, your vertical's wrong. You better get your vertical right or your horizontal will never be right. Someone say amen. 
It says, honor one another above yourself. That's supernatural. It's not natural to do that. And he says, get this, and I got so much more. Be devoted to one another. And I got some room here, folks. I've got some room here to be more devoted. It's not just you four and no more. We are all members of one another. We're the body of Christ. I'm going to live with you forever. I might be right down the road. You better get used to me. We're supposed to come in here wanting to serve one another, not shooting out the door. And it's okay if you got, I'm not, if you got to shoot out the door, shoot out the door. No condom. I mean that. But our heart should be, these are my brothers and sisters. I want to serve. I want to help them. Who has a need? Who can I at least encourage? Have you prayed? Ask yourself, and please don't answer me, because you probably have. Have you prayed for anybody in the church this week besides yourself? Ask yourself that. I know most of you have. Who's burning on your heart in the church? These are your brothers and sisters. Paul talks about gifts in every single time. Romans 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12. It's all body. So much so that I, I am supposed to look out for the interest of my brother ahead of myself. That's supernatural. Folks, it comes when we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. It comes when we have a first love for Jesus. That's, I love Jesus for what he did for me. And in view of his mercy, I'm going to lay down my life for you, Jesus. And Jesus will say, well, as much as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. So I'm not hungry, but they're hungry. Go feed them. I'm not thirsty, they're thirsty. I don't need an encouraging word, they do. I don't need to be healed, they do. He's going to send you to help somebody. And as much as you've done it to them, you've done it to the Lord. John said, how can you have this world's stuff and see your brother in misery and not care about him? I know, you know, we got to do what we, only what we can do, but there should be some compassion on people hurting, right? And if it's just you, 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 we're not seeing this. Your spiritual blessing, your function, your operation, your spirit, this is why we're dead sometimes, because we keep asking God, God, God wants to flow through you like a river to your brothers and sisters. And in that flowing, he's going to bless you. He wants you to love him so much. There's an overflow. And now that overflow, you're going to love your husband. You're going to love your neighbor. You're going to pour out to other people. If you're dry, consider this. I, I got to end. I've really overstayed my welcome. Folks, this all starts when we surrender to the Lord. Someone say amen. amen. I've been repenting all week. The Lord's putting a hunger in me to serve my brother because I love Jesus. I want to love him more. That's how I would pray. I, I would say, Lord, fan that love for you in my heart. Fan that love for you in my heart. When he fans his love in, in your heart for him, you'll, you'll lay down your life. You'll, you'll offer your body a living sacrifice. It won't be because you're under threat of the wrath of God. It'll be in view of God's mercy, just how good he's been to you. Amen? Every eye closed. Church, this isn't going to be an altar call for you. It probably should be. But I've got to do this. If you're here today... And you have not experienced the grace of God in salvation. You've never given your life to the Lord. And you need to do that. Israel was under the wrath without God's mercy. Paul said, we're all children of wrath, separated from God, without the mercy of Jesus Christ. What I'm asking you is, have you received God's gracious gift in Jesus? And if you haven't, what are you waiting for? You need to be saved. You're a sinner, and there's no doubt about it. You need to give your life to the Lord. If that's you, I've got to do this. Church, you need to repent, repent at home. 
Yeah, that's you. I want to see your hand. Say, Brother Brad, I need to give my life to Jesus. I am not serving the Lord. I'm not saved, and, and, and I'm not sure I'm saved. Can I see your hand? I may do this every service, folks. I don't want anybody getting out of here that's not saved. Are you ready to turn your life over to Jesus today? Do you want the mercy of God in your life today? If that is you, I want to see your hand. We'll baptize. We'll take you down to the creek and baptize you today. I don't see any hands. That's good then. We're all on our way to heaven. Father, I pray for me. I pray for us, Lord. And Lord, I, I pray for us that you'll return a first love to us for Jesus. That it really is about your mercy and your grace in our life. And in view of that mercy, Lord, what a little thing it is to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Lord, I haven't lived up to this in my life. I assume that others haven't. Father, I pray for us that we will get this simple, simple truth into our hearts. Love God because of the mercy of God. He loved me first, and now I love him and love your neighbor through the power of the Holy Spirit by the grace of God. Bless your church today, Lord. Let this word sink into us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 That's it.